I forgot to test my mic. Okay. Because I'm the last one to tell whether it's working or not. All of us are afraid of something. And some of us are a little too afraid of one thing. For me, it's wasps. I was highly allergic to wasps when I was a kid. So even today, if there's a wasp flying around, you might as well just stop talking because I'm paying attention to where that wasp is going and not what you're saying. My mom is afraid of granddaddy long legs, which is silly because a granddaddy can't hurt it like a wasp can. She says, yeah, but they can make you hurt yourself getting away from it. Uh, just kind of an illustration that our fears are different, but there are things that we struggle with with fear. And notice a couple of things people are afraid of. Pigeons. There's a recognized phobia of people that are deathly afraid of pigeons. I guess if you want to freak them out, just start going like this and, and that'll get to them. And then there are others, gamma phobia, afraid of fear of getting married, or nomophobia, fear of losing cell service. <laughs> that, I guess, guess that's got to be a new one, right? And then there's ecclesiophobia. A lot of people have this one, fear of being in church. Um, and then how about lupus lipophobia? That's the fear of being chased by wolves while running on a wax floor wearing socks. And then there is anadaphophobia which is the fear that somewhere, someone, somewhere, somehow, a duck is watching you. Now, those last two come from Gary Larson, the far side. They're not really phobias, but the rest are. We can be afraid, and if we are afraid of something, and help, it keeps us from going forward and living our lives the way that we would want to. It has been um, uh, suggested, in fact, William Miller in his book uh, points to this fact, that the command to fear not in the King James, or do not be afraid in the newer translation, is the most repeated command in the Bible. It appears over 200 times in the Old and New Testaments. The most repeated command. Just notice just a few examples. At, at the Red Sea, Moses says, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. And when God is commissioning Joshua as the next ruler, the next leader of Israel, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And Ezekiel, in his commission as a prophet, do not be afraid of them or of their words. Do not be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around, you will live um, or, and you live among the scorpions. No matter what your surroundings, no matter what the feedback you're getting, do not be afraid. Matthew 17, at the Mount of Transfiguration, when the apostles are trying to make sense of what they're seeing, and then all of a sudden God speaks, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, hear ye him. And when the disciples heard this, that, they fell face down to the ground, terrified that Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. In Mark 5, in verse 36, the healing of Jairus' daughter, when they overheard what the people were saying about, don't bother the rabbi anymore, your daughter is dead. Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. And to the little church at, of Smyrna in Revelation 2, do not be afraid of what, of about what you are about to suffer. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Do not be afraid over and over again. Now, we hear that. We think, okay, so um, these people are going through some hard times because of the situation they're in, and God has given them a pep talk. But this is a lot more than just a pep talk because it, every time it appears, do not be afraid is in the grammatical formula of a command. This is God not giving a suggestion, God not speaking to uh, withered emotions as much as he is given a command that he expects to be followed. And when God commands us something and we don't obey, there's a technical expression for that in the Bible. It's called a sin, if God tells us not to be afraid. Now, if that sounds far-fetched or like a big stretch to suggest that fear can be a sin, look at Revelation 21.8. Some of you may remember this verse. This is a verse we use to 
taunt people when we were kids when they were caught in a fib. You know, Revelation, Revelation, 21.8, 21.8. Liars go to hell, liars go to hell. Burn, burn, burn. We were, uh, yeah, we were very sensitive children. But there's a whole list of sins here. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, idolatry, liars, all liars will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur, the, the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Notice the very first word here in the NIV is cowardly, and the King James, it's fearful. It's used in a form when Jesus talks to the apostles and tells them, don't be afraid. To be fearful. Now, does that mean if I'm fearful, I'm going to go to hell? Well, have you ever told a lie? Who has never told a lie? I thought I would give you a, a chance to practice this morning, right? If you raise your hand that you've never told a lie, at the invitation song, you need to come pitter-pattering actually to the back now. Um, yeah, it's not that people who tell a lie are in danger, but if you live your whole life, as a friend used to say, he'd cross the street to tell a lie rather than stand still to tell the truth. You know, If your life is characterized by lying, then that certainly is a warning for you. And if your life is um, characterized by fear, that should be a warning to you uh, as well. Last week we started a series that we're calling Pet Sins. We're going to be looking at what we normally consider uh, little sins uh, or, uh, you know, sins that sometimes we don't even recognize as sins. They're just, well, that's just how I am, you know, sometimes. But the thing with little sins is they can grow into big monsters. Baby dragons always grow up. And today we're going to look at the sin of fear, worry, and anxiety. And before we continue, let me just kind of defend the, the fact that I'm lumping them all together because psychologically those are not the same thing. A fear is always, whether real or imagined, uh, a fear is uh, focused on a particular thing. So being afraid of being chased by wolves, <clears throat> if you're being chased by wolves, that's a legitimate thing. Now, my grandmother had an expression every time she saw a uh, grown-up uh, uh, piece of forest or even somebody's grass that had gotten too long, she would say, oh, that looks wolfish. You know, like the possibility there might be a wolf in there. Uh, but it was still directed at wolves. And anxiety is more of an ill-defined general fear of what's going to happen in the future. And so it's not connected necessarily to a particular thing, although fears and anxieties can overlap quite a deal. You know, sometimes people that have a fear of flying, there's one thing they're afraid of flying, really are suffering from an anxiety of being in a situation where they're out of control. Um, and flying is, is just one aspect of that. But in Scripture, these are really all the same things. There are texts where Jesus says, do not be afraid, where Jesus says, do not worry, and where Jesus says, do not be anxious. And they're all about the same thing, the future, what's going to happen in the future, and is God going to take care of us or not? So in that regard, anyway, we can lump all three of these into the, the same bucket. And I wanted to start with, since we mentioned the uh, chosen, um, I wanted to start with the, what we sometimes call the limited commission. Now, we call it the limited commission where Jesus sends out his apostles. Uh, and this text is where Jesus is preparing them to be sent out. Um, it's a limited commission because he tells them specifically only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't go to, particularly he says, specifically, don't go to the Samaritans, don't go to the Gentiles. Now later on when he gives what we call the Great Commission, in Luke's version of that, he reverses it and says, I want you to go, you will be my witnesses to Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world, specifically mentioning Jews, Samaritans, and, and Gentiles. But see, the limited commission is just a trial run. They're getting their feet wet in this going and preaching thing. And he tells them some things they're going to do. They're, he's going to, they're going to be able to cast out demons. They're going to be able to heal people. God's power is going to be on them. But they're also going to run into some opposition. Now, some of the instructions that Jesus gives don't apply to us. 
He says, when you go, don't take any extra clothes and don't take any cash. Now, if you're planning on going on vacation, I don't suggest that you follow those instructions. Those instructions aren't for us. But his warnings about opposition very well do apply to us. We can't expect the world to receive us any differently than it received him. But all through the warning part of this text, he tells them, don't be afraid. So do not be afraid of them. These are the people that are going to put you in prison, he says. For there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. The people that, per- that persecute you, they're going to face an account for that. And then two verses later, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Be more afraid of the God who is sending you out on this mission than on the local officials that you run into in the process. And then finally in verse 31, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. He's, God knows your hairs or the head are numbered. He knows when the sparrow has hit the ground. So don't be afraid. God has got you. Trust God. So over and over again, Jesus warns them not to be afraid. The reason is that fear is what can get in their way. Fear is what can keep them from following, uh, from, from going forth and doing what it is that Jesus says. There's this um, choice they have. They can give in to fear or they can go forward in faith. Uh, So this command, fear not, is sort of necessary to them before they are going to be ready to do what it is that Jesus tells them. And I wonder if we can just not make that application to ourselves right now. If we are not willing to trust God more than we fear what might happen here, if, if we are not, not willing to step out of our comfort zone where there is no fear and follow wherever it may be that God is leading us, we're never going to be able to follow him as we should. Notice a couple of sea stories that sort of illustrate for us um, how the apostles are impacted by their fear. Now, we're suggesting that fear and faith are two opposite choices, that we have to choose one or the other, but we can't have both. And I think these stories sort of illustrate that. Um, The first one is that the apostles are caught in this storm. Uh, They're rowing the boat or going across the Sea of Galilee. Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat, as it's going to be apparent. He must be on Dramamine or or something, because he's sleeping. And then a storm comes up, and the boat is rocking. These are experienced see people here. You know, they're professional fishermen. And so when they are afraid that they're going to die, this must be that kind of a storm. And so they wake up Jesus and say, don't you even care that we're getting ready to die? And Jesus turns to the storm and goes, hush, peace, be still. And then he turns to the apostles and goes, hush. And well, here's what he really says. He said to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Why are you afraid of a storm if you believe I am who you've said you believe I am? If you're in the presence of Messiah, of of the one who came as God in the flesh, then should you be more comforted by my presence than you are afraid of what might happen? The second story is also a a storm. This one, uh, Jesus... uh, it sends a crowd away. He's been trying for a while to get rid of the crowd so he can spend some time alone and, and pray. And so he sends the apostles across the lake and he goes up to the mountain to pray. And while they're going across the lake, um, a storm comes up. The wind is so strong, they can't make any headway. And so they're rowing and rowing and trying their best, but they can't get anywhere. And here's where the story takes a little Stephen King type twist. They look, and here comes somebody walking across the water. And, and they think it's a ghost, and they're afraid. Um, but Jesus said, It's not a ghost, it's me. And Peter says, well, if, you, uh, if it's really you, let me come walking to you. And Jesus says, come on down. And here comes Peter walking across the water. And as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he's fine. But then he begins to see the wind and the waves and the storm. And he does a wily coyote. Remember the cartoons when he runs out across the air And he's okay until he looks down and then he falls like a rock. Peter begins to sink. 
Here's the text. But when he saw the wind, and he was afraid. Uh, when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And of course, immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? You see the comparison between faith and fear. Peter was fine as long as his eyes were on Jesus, but when he began to be distracted and he starts giving in to his fear, he becomes ye of little faith. And I wonder if that doesn't remind us of the choice that we have to make this morning. Are we going to be people who choose faith or fear? It was fear that was going to get in the way of the apostles truly being who Jesus was calling them to be. And so he tells them over and over again, do not be afraid. Fear will get in the way of us being whom God calls us to be. And so Jesus tells us, do not be afraid. If we give in to fear, we can't be what Christ is calling us to be. If we're afraid, we will not trust that God has us no matter what the storm is. If, we, if we're afraid, then we won't share our blessings with others because we'll be too afraid. What if I give this away and I need it later? Fear will keep us from doing that. Fear will keep us angry at the way the country is going and, and keep us on edge all the time and not able to trust that God has our country just as well as he has our individual lives. And fear will make us disheveled and afraid because of any change that takes place. In church, because we don't believe that God really has the church in his hand any more than he has the country in his hand any more than he has us. Are we going to choose faith or are we going to choose fear? So, what if, um, what if fear, anxiety, worry is your pet sin? What are you supposed to do about it? How can we be better at handling these kinds of things? Let me suggest just four things. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list. We may get through and decide it's not even a particularly good list, but it's my list. Things that you can try, things that <clears throat> we should all do if we're struggling with worry and fear. The first is, remember what Jesus said about how well uh, fear works, how well worry is beneficial. Because Jesus said in Luke 12, who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Actually, we know that stress and worry and anxiety can take hours off your life. Since you cannot do this very little thing, what do you worry about the rest? Jesus reminds us that worry is never productive and it is often counterproductive. In the text, depending on the translation that you're reading, this can be translated, who can add a single hour to their life or a single cubit to their height? When I was in high school, I wanted to dunk a basketball, some kind of fierce. And I prayed that God would make me taller so I could do that. Um, prayer might be able to do that. God can do anything. But worrying about it won't. We can't worry about it just totally counterproductive. So just remember, if you're worried, if you're stressed, if you're, if you're anxious about something, if you're fearful about something, just remind yourself this state of mind that I've whipped myself into is not helping anything, and it's certainly sucking the joy out of my life. Harold Hazlip was one of my professors in graduate school. He passed away a couple of months uh, ago. Uh, wonderful, sweet man. He actually spoke at Denby one time, asked Lynn about how she tried to steal his luggage. She can, you can do that later. But uh, he wrote a little book called Lord Help Me When I'm Hurting, and he referenced a study that was done on things that uh, common people uh, worry about, fret about, and the percentage of uh, where those are. And it found that 40% of the fear, whatever it is that we fear, never comes to be. So 40% of the things that we're worried about, well, you see, 30% are things in the past. You know, you're, you're trying to make this decision and you make it and you go ahead and then you worry and fret and fear that you made the wrong decision. Well, of course, you can't, do anything, you can't do anything about something that's not going to happen anyway. And you can't do anything about something that has already happened. So we're already up to 70%. 12%, we worry about the criticism of others. 
People say ugly things to us, and we worry because we're not as liked as we would like to be. Of course, we have no control over the way people perceive us, and so we're worried over things over which we have no control. 10% are over health concerns. Now, if you've got a health problem that's nagging you, uh, we have a couple of our members that are, uh, that are looking at surgery this week to be concerned, to be worried. Uh, that would be a normal thing, but it, it, as far as being able to do anything about that, we can't. In fact, the more we're fearful, the more we worry, the bigger hit we take on our health. And then finally, if you do the math, 8% of the things that we fear are legitimate fears things that we can do something about. So just remind yourself that this state, what's going to happen is what's going to happen, and God is in control. But this state that I've worked myself into is simply not helpful at all. The second thing um, is try to hang around hopeful people, positive people, people that seem to have uh, an easy time with their fears. In fact, we could broaden that and just say, as I'm getting ready to, hang around God's people. Uh, That's really the reason. Why is it we come to church? Do we come to church to punch our ticket so when we get to heaven, we have enough punches in order to get in to heaven? You know, the worst thing uh, that uh, some folks are going to find when they get to the pearly gates is, hey, they really were counting Wednesday nights. Boy, that'll be a letdown for a lot of people. No, we're not doing it to punch a ticket. We're not even doing it uh, to do holy things that will make God happy with us. That's a pagan view of worship. The pagans worship their gods to put their gods in a good mood so gods would leave them alone. We are to remind ourselves in worship that God is God and therefore we are his people. But the primary scripture stated reason for worship is not about the holy things that we do in worship, but the impact that it has on us. We are to encourage one another. That's the reason that we come together. The reason we come together is not so much the things that happen, is that when we're together, we're reminded that we're surrounded by people that share the same hope that we do. You know, the text that we often use uh, to browbeat people into coming to church Sounds really different when you look at it in a a different translation. This is the message, Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 25. Let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. He always keeps his word. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out, not avoiding worshiping together as some some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. That the whole point of getting together is to encourage one another and find ways, different ways, to encourage and focus where our hope is. So we need to focus on being with hopeful people. When we're around others that share some of the same worries... You know, you get with your bunch that believe about the same thing politically and you get to talking and you just sort of reinforce each other's. That doesn't help. Having a forum where you can discuss things that concern you is good. But when you get with folks and you just reinforce your... That's why I think Bob Bean is such a great elder. It's hard to complain around him. I don't know if you've noticed this before, you know... You complain about, boy, the weather is really terrible today. He'll say something like, and I know, I played this game with him. He'll say, yeah, but the weather was beautiful yesterday. <laughs> He'll find something good about whatever it is you're complaining about. Remember the example that I used years ago of my friend who the very first time we went to Pepperdine, we were looking over this great vista, a beautiful the Pacific Ocean and the hills leading down to it. And he comes up, but we're in the cafeteria. He comes up behind us and goes, man, I can't believe they would, see, would serve powdered eggs in a place like this. Here we are seeing this beautiful work of God. Don't be like that guy. Be like Bob. And, and hang around people like Bob that can uh, show you a different aspect, a different viewpoint of life. Third, when fear gets near, pray. Jesus, on the, the night that he was betrayed, takes his apostles to Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. 
He took Peter and James and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Was Jesus afraid the night before his crucifixion? Maybe not in exactly the same way that we are. We generally are afraid because we don't know what's going to happen. He was distressed and troubled because he knew exactly what was going to happen. But the word that is translated deeply distressed is just a form of the word for fear. In fact, Luke uses the word in his version of the same story, the Greek word agonia, from which we get the word agony, um, which is translated in the lexicons as fear. So when fear got near, what did Jesus do? He went to pray, spent all night praying. He even wanted other people to pray for him. He had, he had the apostles praying for him, but they kept falling asleep. He kept waking them up, and they kept falling asleep. So you've got to be careful who it is you get praying for you. But when you're struggling with fear, pray. We believe in a God who is near us. What I thought about when uh, Betty was making her comments earlier was uh, in Deuteronomy, the statement is made, uh, Moses says to the people of Israel, what are their God, whether a nation has a God who loves us so much that he comes near us when we pray. When we pray, God comes near in some sense. Um, we believe that God changes things. And we also believe that prayer changes God. When you're struggling, pray. And then feed your faith, not your fear. The reason that little uh, party took place on uh, the Capitol, or in the Capitol building on January 6th, the January 6th insurrection, because a bunch of people got stuck in their little echo chamber, and they, they kept hearing the same things over and over again because that's what they choose to hear. And they made themselves so afraid that they thought they were going to lose their country. And the more they heard, the more convinced they were they had to do something. And a lot of those people are in jail right now. If they would have stepped away from their echo chamber, if they would have turned off the TV for a week, if they would have stopped listening to the podcast and stopped reading the blogs, that would never have happened. When you give in to fear, you tend to reinforce that. And so why don't we step out of the echo chamber and step into God's echo chamber? Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. So when things are happening and, and you're getting more and more stressed, turn that off and turn some of that on. Our attitudes are going to be formed by the kind of uh, inputs that we allow into our heart. And so we don't always have control, but sometimes we do have control. So turn off the world's echo chamber and turn on God's echo chamber and reinforce your heart and mind and soul with those promises that he gives us, that he is always with us, that he will never leave us alone, that he is always our God. And then maybe fear won't be such a thing. Fear not, 200 plus times in the Bible. Are we going to choose fear or are we going to choose faith? Let's pray together. Father, we live in scary times, but then that's always been the case. We live in a world that uh, wants to tear our faith in you away from us, but that's always been true as well. Father, our prayer is that you will put in our hearts every day to remember that you're in control of the universe, that our faith uh, drives us to believe that you can help us and save us no matter what situation we find ourselves in. 
that not only does our fear and our worry and our anxiety not work, that it stands in the way of letting us see you and how you're working in our lives. Father, help us to be people of faith and not of fear. Through Jesus we pray.